Okay, we're ready. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is the um, Global Poisson meeting, uh, October 8th. And we are uh, very pleased to have Nigel Hitchin from University of Oxford uh, to speak about Teichmiller spaces and the geometry of geodesics. I'll just remind everybody to keep yourself muted. Um, and um, uh, and uh, you could either post questions in the chat or raise your hand. And then um, we'll we'll periodically break to to um, get to your questions. All right, Nigel, let's begin. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this, uh, this seminar. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is not what you would call pure poisson, but there's uh, I think there's plenty of symplectic stuff in it. So I hope you'll uh, I hope you'll uh, agree that it's appropriate now. I'm just about to share my screen, so let's see see what happens. So. And now I need to. Uh, what do I not play? Just unmuted myself. Sorry. Uh, play. Now, is that okay? That looks good. Okay, so there you see the deconstructed Penrose tiles. Yeah. Um. Okay, so. So what I'm going to talk about is, so the way I'm going to talk about it is to introduce a number of themes which some of you may be familiar with and some, some of you may perhaps not so familiar, uh, which build up to a question. And then I'll, I'll try and uh, discuss how, how far I've got into uh, realizing uh, the answer to that, to that question. So that's a little bit vague, but let me begin with the first theme, which uh, I think... Uh, uh, okay, so wait a minute. Okay, so I need to uh, I need to minimize something. Okay, so okay, so the first theme is um, okay. Geodesics. This is something which I'm sure is familiar to uh, to everybody. But let me just uh, uh, let me just go through it. Okay. So uh, if we have a Riemannian metric, then it defines a function on the cotangent bundle. And uh, this is, generates a Hamiltonian vector field, which is the geodesic flow. Well, if we identify the tangent bundle and the cotangent bundle using the metric, it's the geodesic flow. So this is giving us an action of the real numbers on uh, the cotangent bundle. And uh, this uh, preserves the unit sphere bundle, the level set of uh, H. And so the quotient of that is a, a, a symplectic manifold, so long as it's uh, it's a good uh, a good space, good Hausdorff manifold space. So we produce this way. Well, and what is it? It's the space of oriented geodesics on the Riemannian manifold. So geodesics, oriented geodesics, form a uh, symplectic uh, manifold when they are a manifold. Of course, they're not always. So. If, uh, for example, if we have a, a compact surface, um, sigma of genus greater than one, uh, with a metric of negative curvature, then of course there's no uh, good space of geodesics on the surface itself. But if we go to the universal covering, then, uh, then there is a good space. In fact, the space of oriented geodesics is isomorphic to a circle times the real numbers. So how would you do that? Well, you choose a point and take a geodesic through that point, the red line here, then that parameterizes uh, the geodesics, uh, which are perpendicular to that line. And in the, if you like, in the orientation direction uh, as, it, as it goes this way. So, so we're parameterizing this family of geodesics by a direction given by the direction of the geodesic at the point and a real number, which is the position along that geodesic. And the other way around is if I'm given a geodesic, I can look at the, the geodesic, which is, uh, forms the shortest uh, distance from the point O to that geodesic, and it lies on, on such, a, such a red geodesic. So, so we have this, uh, so what we, we have is that the, the product, this surface S1 cross R is a symplectic uh, manifold and it's the, uh, it's, okay, the symplectic form is the, is the standard one. It's diffeomorphic to the standard symplectic form. So uh, this is in the universal covering of sigma. 
so the fundamental group acts as uh, isometries on the universal covering. And so it acts on geodesics. And so it gives us a, a symplectic, each element of the fundamental group gives us a symplectic diffeomorphism of S1 cross R. And it turns out that these are actually, so the S1 cross R is not simply connected, so that these are Hamiltonian uh, diffeomorphisms. So uh, if you want to, if we, if we take a constant negative curvature metric, then the universal covering, of course, is hyperbolic space, the upper half plane, or the unit disk, and uh, the space of oriented geodesics here is basically the, the product of the boundary, the, brand, the RP1 is the boundary with itself, uh, where you remove the diagonal. So you have an initial point and a final point uh, for, a, for an oriented geodesic. So it's, this is the surface and the symplectic form. If X and Y are affine coordinates on RP1, then this is, uh, uh, this is the symplectic form. So, uh, okay, so what can we say about that? So that's the end of the, the first theme. So now uh, the second theme, is, which may be uh, uh, perhaps less familiar, is this notion of SU infinity. So this is something I learned many, many years ago from a physicist, from Jens Hopper, and he wrote a paper about this all those years ago. And what it says is that we should think of SU infinity, SUN, where N is infinity, as the group of symplectic diffeomorphisms of the two-sphere. Uh, why? Well, there are a number of reasons why. Let, uh, let me start with a few. So, um, so the Lie algebra of the symplectic diffeomorphisms is, of course, the space of Hamiltonian functions modulo the constants. And because the two sphere is compact, we can actually normalize those to make them zero integral. So, um, so then if you, if you take the n-dimensional irreducible representation of SU2, and you decompose the Lie algebra of SUN under the action of SU2, then what you get is the three dimensional plus the five dimensional. So you break it up into irreducibles and you get the three plus five all the way up to, to n minus one. On the other hand, if you uh, <coughs> break up the functions on the two sphere into irreducibles, these are the spherical harmonics, represent in the irreducible representations of SO3, and this is the three plus the five, et cetera, but, but uh, an infinite number of them. So there's one way of thinking that uh, as n goes to infinity, the, uh, the Lie algebra breaks up, at least according to this uh, three-dimensional subgroup, in a way which is parallel to, to that of SUN. Another thing that we have is that uh, we have invariant polynomials. If I take a function f, raise it to the mth power and integrate against the symplectic form, then that's an invariant polynomial on the Lie algebra, which is uh, kind of like the trace of uh, a to the m in, in SUN. So there's there another way in which you can look at this. Uh, so if we take the, if we realize the irreducible representation of SU2 in uh, dimension n plus one, we can realize that as the action of SU2 on the vector space of holomorphic sections of the line bundle of degree n on CP1. So CP1 is the two sphere with its, uh, its metric. This gives these, this space of sections uh, a, a Hermitian metric, and we get a, a, a unitary representation, SU2 into SUN plus one. This is irreducible. This is the way you realize such uh, a representation. So now if we have a, an element of the Lie algebra of SU infinity, uh, namely a, a smooth function on CP1. And we take a holomorphic section S of uh, ON, then you can define this Tuplitz operator. You, you take this section, you multiply by F, so F times S is no longer holomorphic, but using the Hermitian metric, you can orthogonally project back onto the holomorphic sections. And this gives you an action of uh, F on this finite dimensional space, this n plus one dimensional space. And uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the bracket um, of two of these, take two functions and you look at the bracket of these two uh, actions, then 
then you see there's an asymptotic expansion as n goes to infinity, where the leading term is the, is the Poisson bracket. So, so there's a sense here that as n goes to infinity, these uh, Lie brackets that come from the, uh, the tuplets operators approach the, the Poisson bracket, and therefore the, uh, the Lie bracket of the Hamiltonian vector fields on, on, on the two sphere. So that's, uh, that's SU infinity. So if you ask, you know, well, how do we go from SU2 to SU infinity? Well, why do we look at the two sphere? Well, one way of saying it is that you're looking at a co-joint orbit, uh, SU2 over U1, which is of course uh, symplectic, homogeneous space uh, of SU2, it's a symplectic surface. So now let's look at a non-compact group, look at SL2R, then there are two generic co-joint orbits. There's, uh, if we, there's one of them is hyperbolic space itself. If you divide out by SO2. And in that case, I would like to say that the, the symplectic diffeomorphisms of hyperbolic space are uh, SU infinity infinity. So there I'm thinking of SL2R as being SU 1 comma 1. Uh, but more interesting for us is uh, what I want to call SL infinity R as being the, by taking the, the other co-joint orbit, uh, which is the space of geodesics on the upper half plane. So SL to R modulo uh, the action of the, of the reals. So, so this is my definition, if you like, of SL infinity R. It's the Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of uh, S1 cross R. So what can we say? What can we say is that if I have a surface with a metric of negative curvature, then I have a homomorphism from pi one to SL infinity R by thinking of the way in which the uh, pi one acts on the oriented geodesics on the universal covering of, of sigma. So this is the, the space that I want, I'm interested in. I would like to I'll try and understand ideally a moduli space for representations of pi one into SL infinity R, and to ask the question about whether it bears resemblances to the finite dimensional situation. So pi one into SLN R. So the next theme I need to introduce is the, the way in which you understand uh, representations in SLN R using uh, a theory of Higgs bundles. So, okay, what is a Higgs bundle? Well, uh, so now we have a, our surface sigma and we have a complex structure on it. So we make it into a Riemann surface. And a Higgs bundle is a holomorphic vector bundle V on sigma together with a Higgs field, which is a, a section of the endomorphism bundle twisted with the canonical bundle, so K the bundle of uh, holomorphic one forms. And uh, if, if there's a stability condition, if the stability condition holds for this pair of objects, then there's a theorem that there exists a Hermitian metric on the vector bundle V, such that the connection, the curvature of the connection defined by that uh, metric uh, satisfies this, this equation here, these Higgs bundle equations. And uh, the importance for us is that uh, if it satisfies those equations, then actually you get a flat connection. You take the, the unitary connection coming from the Hermitian structure and the holomorphic structure, and you add on this uh, phi plus phi star, then this is a, a flat connection. So a, a Higgs bundle gives you a flat GLNC connection and therefore a homomorphism, the holonomy of the flat connection gives you a homomorphism from pi one to GLNC. So if we want to look at SLNR inside here, well, that would be a certain uh, subspace of representations and therefore described by some subspace of the uh, space of Higgs bundles. And uh, so what do you do? Well, there's a standard procedure for this. You, you take, if you have a real form here, you take the maximal compact subgroup of the real form. In this case, it's SON. 
and you take A, the unitary connection to be a, an SON connection, and then the, the Higgs field you take to be in the opposite. So the, the, the connection here is skew symmetric and you, you want the Higgs field to be symmetric. So, if, so basically by reducing to an SON connection, you put a holomorphic or orthogonal structure on V and then you require the Higgs field to be symmetric in order to get a, a, a flat connection with holonomy in SLNR. So this has been studied for a long, long time. And the standard example is if you take a, a decomposable bundle, just you take a, a square root of the canonical bundle and take the sum with its inverse. And uh, then you take a Higgs field, which looks like this, where Q is a quadratic differential. Then on the surface sigma of genus G, there's a 3G minus three dimensional space of quadratic differentials. And it turns out that what you get here is a 3D, 3G minus three dimensional complex dimensional space of representations, uh, which actually fills out a whole component, a whole connected component of the uh, space of representations into SL2R up to, up to equivalence. So this is, uh, this is Teichmuller space. This is, the, in fact, so all of these representations in this component are uniformizing representations. So they come from a metric of constant negative curvature, or if you like, a holomorphic uh, structure. And uh, if you go from SL to R to SLNR, then it turns out that uh, you can do exactly the same sort of thing, but now you take a direct sum of uh, line bundles or a larger direct sum, you begin with this negative power of the canonical bundle and go up to the corresponding positive power. And the Higgs field looks like this, uh, where the A2s are quadratic differentials, the A3s are cubic differentials and so on and so forth. So this, this Higgs field is uh, symmetric about a, uh, an, an anti-diagonal, if you like. And that's, that's really the, uh, so the, the, Orthogonal structure on V is really obtained by pairing uh, the, the bottom with the top and so on and so forth. Anyway, this is, this is a symmetric Higgs field. And uh, what, you get is, uh, what you get is a moduli space now, which is not just uh, quadratic differentials, it's a direct sum of differentials of degree three, four, five, all the way up to N. And this, it turns out, uh, is uh, also a connected component of the, uh, the moduli space of representations into SLNR. So this is a, a generalized version of Teichmuller space. Uh, and it's, okay, so it's, it's a vector space. And um, so, and not only that, but actually uh, SL2R and in its irreducible representation sits inside here. So if we take all the A3s and above it to, to be equal to zero and keep the A2, then this is a copy of, uh, ordinary Teichmuller space sitting inside this bigger one. And it corresponds to this, the irreducible representation of uh, SL2R and SLNR. So, um, so the question is, is there such a space for N equals infinity? Uh, and can we interpret this in terms of some, uh, some geometry on the surface? So what do we do? Well obvious thing to do is to try and study uh, SU infinity Higgs bundles. So this is my th third theme, I guess it's the third one. And this is something which I started looking at a few years ago. Um, so given that uh, we understand SU infinity as the symplectic diffeomorphism of the two sphere, what is, a, what is a connection on an SU infinity bundle? So SU infinity, we want to think of this as being like the compact group. So, uh, so well, it's uh, geometrically, we have to think of having a four manifold uh, fibering over the surface sigma, whose fiber is a two sphere. And what we want is a symplectic form on the two sphere, symplectic form along the fibers. So that's what a, an SU infinity bundle is. It's, a, if you like, a bundle whose structure group is the diffeomorphisms of the two sphere and uh, we have a symplectic structure so we can reduce the, uh, the structure group to the symplectic diffeomorphisms. 
So a connection on this is a, a horizontal subbundle. And so that's, a, if you like, a diff S2 connection. If we want it to be a, a symplectic connection, then we, we would like the, uh, the lifts of the horizontal lifts of vector fields to preserve the symplectic form along the fibers. Uh, but if we want to uh, take an analog of this infinite dimensional Teichmuller space, then we should reduce this to SO infinity. So what is SO infinity sitting inside SU infinity? So I claim that this should be the symplectic diffeomorphisms which commute with reflection about an equator. So, um, so we have a, if you like, a, a symplectic, so we have an involution, an anti-symplectic, so the, if you like, reflection about an equator is an anti-symplectic involution. And so to have a reduction of the structure group of this SU infinity bundle to SO infinity means endowing M4 with a, a fiber-wise involution of this, of this type. Uh, okay, so, that, so what is the Higgs field? Well, the Higgs field has got to be a, if you like, a, a one form on the base. Well, it's got to be a one form with values in the Lie algebra. Well, the Lie algebra consists of the functions on the two sphere. So uh, complexified, it's uh, basically a, a complex valued function on the two sphere with values in the canonical bundle. So that's basically a section, in fact, a holomorphic section of, well, we have to be careful about what we mean by holomorphic, but anyway, it's a section of the pullback of the canonical bundle of sigma. So that's the setup. Uh, and so uh, what are the equations? So when you look at the Higgs bundle equations and interpret them appropriately, then uh, what it gives you is a, a hyperkähler metric on uh, the four manifold M. This is a kind of quite well-known phenomenon that if you, if you pass from a, a gauge theory for a finite dimensional group to a diffeomorphism group, then if you like gauge theory becomes uh, becomes metric geometry, becomes gravity, gauge theory becomes gravity, whatever. Anyway, it's, uh, this is what you get. It's a hyperkähler metric on M, but uh, you have an involution and this involution gives you a, a singularity. Well, if M is a two sphere bundle over sigma, there are, we, we know very well that the only compact hyperkähler manifolds in four dimensions are K3 surfaces and tori. So there has to be a singularity. In, in this case, the singularity occurs on the fixed point set of the involution, which is a circle bundle over the surface. And it's a, it's a fold singularity. So this is a, it's where the symplectic form along uh, becomes, okay, so what I should say is, of course, that a hyperkähler metric has three symplectic forms. And uh, if we, uh, one of them, uh, if we restrict to the two sphere becomes the standard symplectic form, but the other two have uh, have this fold singularity on the on the equator, the, the fixed point set of this involution. So this was a, a setup which I uh, I put forward in a, a paper, this paper, uh, some years ago, and uh, and made certain uh, conjectures in it. And uh, it turned out that uh, Olivier Bicard actually uh, proved one of these conjectures, uh, which was uh, uh, really a very interesting uh, feature and it's uh, central to what I'm going to say today. So the point is that if we take that, uh, the standard uh, model, if we take, in fact, this is the simplest possible model, so which is, this is basically the, uh, the Higgs bundle version of the constant negative curvature, which is canonically associated to the holomorphic structure on sigma, then, uh, then you can work out very easily the, this hyperkähler metric. It has, uh, on the universal covering, it has a great deal of symmetry. So for those who know about hyperkähler metrics, it's like a, a different form of the aguchi hansen metric. So the aguchi hansen metric is a complete metric defined on the cotangent bundle of the, of the two sphere uh, this is uh, uh, an incomplete metric defined on the cotangent bundle of the, of the disk. Uh, and it's uh, because of its invariance, it descends to, uh, to the quotient by a, a discrete group. So you take this uh, explicit hyperkähler metric and then you ask for um, deformations of this. 
And what Bicard proved is that there are, there are deformations which are parameterized locally by the space that we would like to be a kind of infinite dimensional version of Teichmuller space. So, so Bicard, so it's locally, it's, it's, it's given by deformations, first order deformations and then uh, integrating them, showing that they, they, are, they are integrals. So, so if you like, it's uh, where the, these differentials are very small, then in a suitable uh, sense, then, uh, then we do get these, uh, we get a space, we get a space of hyperkilometrics and uh, this is what SU infinity Higgs bundle gives you, but it's not at all clear why this has anything to do with uh, uh, SL infinity R as I've uh, described it. So for what is the problem? Well, the problem is that of course in, in finite dimensions, these uh, the groups, the compact group and the uh, non-compact group, the different real forms, uh, they're real forms of a complexification, which is a perfectly well-defined group. And there's no complexification of a group of uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. We can't, we can't do the same procedure as happens in Higgs bundle theory in finite dimensions. Now, you might say that, uh, well, Donaldson, in his, uh, I mean, the starting point for his famous work on case stability and so forth is to describe a a substitute for the complexification of a group of symplectic diffeomorphisms uh, in terms of uh, space of Kähler potentials. And it's uh, obviously a very profitable idea. And I think it's, it's quite possible that it has a role to play in uh, what I'm talking about, but, um, but more in the hyper Kähler setting, more, more, if you like, of replacing some of uh, Bicard's deformation arguments by a different type of, uh, of problem. So I don't see it, uh, that as playing a role in what, what, I, what I want to do here. And so, uh, so this is what I, uh, I would like to do. I would like to actually uh, start again, if you like. So that's the end point uh, of, that's the end point, if you like, of the themes. And uh, now, if you like, I want to start afresh try and understand how to describe differential geometrically SL infinity R connections. And at the end of this, I want to point out how Bicard's result actually plays uh, uh, an important role. Could I ask a question before you go on? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, in, in your setup that you described, you were looking at the analog of SL and R. Could you just make a comment about uh, why you were led to consider this real form rather than the SU2 originally? Um, oh, this, well, this, I mean, SLNR, because it has this type, I mean, okay, SLNR is a split real form. And what we know is that this, uh, this kind of phenomenon, these, uh, these spaces of representations, these components, which are vector spaces or have a realization as vector spaces occur for split real forms. And so, uh, I mean, although there are other real forms, SU, NN, and so forth, even in finite dimensions, the structure of the moduli space is very complicated. So the idea is that these, uh, this, uh, this feature of ordinary Teichmuller space, that it's contractible, it's, it's, it's a cell or whichever language you like to talk about, that it's diffeomorphic to a Euclidean space, these hold for these, uh, for these split real forms mm -hmm. and uh, that's the sort of uh, that's the picture that I, I would like to extend into uh, into to infinity. So I've no idea what uh, I've no conjectures about what S, SU infinity infinity would be. What kind of structure uh, such a moduli space would, would have? I see, but you could but okay. imagine that this picture might be extendable for other real forms of other groups. It's conceivable. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um. In fact, we, in fact, we're just going to meet in a, in a few minutes uh, another uh, infinity group. Um, anyway, so let's uh, let's go on. Okay. So, um, so if we want to understand uh, a representation uh, of pi one into the group of symplectic, into symplectic transformations of S one cross R, well, we just do same sort of thing that I discussed with the S U infinity once. We we look for a flat symplectic connection. So. We look for a four manifold 
which fibers over sigma with fiber S1 cross R. And we're looking for a horizontal subbundle. And now, now we're looking for a flat connection. So we want that to be an integral subbundle. And then uh, we want a symplectic form along the fibers, which is preserved by the horizontal lift of vector fields on sigma. So there's a, a, a simple way of doing this. Um, so suppose on my manifold M, I have a closed two form alpha such that alpha wedge alpha equals zero. So this, is, uh, this means that alpha is decomposable. This is the quadratic condition for the, uh, the Klein quadric. And what that means is that the annihilator of alpha is a, a two dimensional subspace. So it's, and if alpha restricted to a fiber is non-degenerate, then it does two things. On the one hand, it gives us a, a symplectic form on the fiber. On the other hand, it's annihilator gives us a horizontal subspace. And if alpha is closed, then it's actually a flat connection. The horizontal subspace is integrable. And if alpha is exact, then in fact, uh, we get uh, not just symplectic holonomy, but Hamiltonian holonomy. So um, right at the beginning, I said that uh, if I have a metric of constant negative curve, not constant, I'm sorry, a metric of negative curvature on a surface, then uh, the action of uh, pi one on the space oriented geodesics gives me a, re a representation into SL infinity R. So uh, I want to tell you next how, uh, how that's realized in this, in this setting. So here I'm going to introduce, uh, so I'm taking the unit circle bundle of uh, a Romanian metric. And we have, a, there's a canonical basis for this. So um, the circle action gives me a, a vector field along the fibers, I call that Z. I have the geodesic flow, and that's a horizontal vector field, horizontal with respect to the levi civita connection. And on the tangent space of sigma, I have a complex structure. And so I multiply X by I, and that gives me another vector field, another horizontal vector field, Y. So I have these things, X, Y, and Z. So X and Y are orthogonal and they satisfy uh, these relations. So these are vector fields on U, the unit circle bundle on three manifold. They satisfy these relations here where K is here the, the Gaussian curvature of the, of the metric. So corresponding to these uh, vector fields, there is a, uh, there's a dual basis, omega, theta, eta. They each have their own interpretation. So if you like, eta is the form which is, uh, uh, evaluates on Z to be one. So it's actually a, the connection form for the, uh, the levi civita connection. Anyway, uh, so we want to construct out of this a four manifold whose fiber is S1 cross R. So you take this vector field Y and you integrate it to a one parameter group of uh, diffeomorphisms. And then you pull back the, uh, the, the one form omega by this and take alpha to be D of this. So and what you find is that this is, okay. So written in terms of this basis, omega, theta, eta, it looks like this. So what you see here is already that it's, um, that it's exact, that it's decomposable, and uh, it, so now we've got to look at uh, what happens. Uh, okay, well, first of all, first thing is that this is not a very convenient expression. And so we can rewrite this in terms of um, the standard basis. And if you do that, then you see that alpha is, uh, is written like this, where F1 and F2 are functions on U cross R, which satisfy as a function of T, they satisfy this, uh, this uh, ODE uh, with the initial conditions, with these initial conditions. So, uh, so this is a, okay. So now, now if we restrict uh, this form to the fiber, uh, then what you get is, uh, is this. And uh, if, uh, if, the, if the bundle, if the, sorry, if the curvature is negative, then you'll see that F2 is, uh, 
uh, f2 prime is never zero not only that but it actually gives us a, a reparameterization of the of the real line so this gives you basically the the standard uh, symplectic structure on s1 cross r so on each fiber so eta is of course the standard so uh, d theta if you like and this is now this is a this is a dr so, uh, so I claim that this actually uh, is the geometric uh, version of the action of pi one on the space of oriented geodesics. Um, so first of all, so, so, okay, so a metric of negative curvature then through this construction uh, gives you a representation into SL infinity R. There's information about the metric uh, contained in this representation uh, for example, the length of closed geodesics, that's something you can read off from this. It really, it really goes back to uh, Crofton's formula, you know, about the, uh, the length of uh, the distance between two points being equal to the, um, the symplectic area uh, between two, okay, two points. Two points on a, in the space give you two circles in the space of geodesics. And they intersect in two domains, and basically the integral of the symplectic form over one of these gives you the distance between the two points. Anyway, anyway, this is a this is a feature a feature of it. You, of course, you're losing a lot of information about the metric, but you are gaining information about uh, the closed geodesics. <clears throat> the other thing is that, um, in fact, the representations that you get this way are are actually can be connected to uniformizing representations in SL2R. So that's, that's a consequence of, uh, of Ricci flow. So the early, early application of Ricci flow by Hamilton, uh, it shows that if you have a, a negatively curved metric on a surface, then Ricci flow takes you through negatively curved metrics to a constant negative curvature one. So if you, so uh, this, family of representations coming from negatively curved metrics bears some similarity with the, the Teichmuller spaces for SLNR in that they it certainly contains, at least they, these representations are connected continuously to a uniformizing representation. Um, so the obvious question is, uh, is it possible that all deformations, uh, if you like, is it possible that all representations in SL infinity R are obtained by, um, or are not all representations, I should say, all representations connected to the uniformizing representation, is it possible that these are all obtained by negatively curved metrics? So the answer is no. Um, so what's the reason? Well, so, uh, the reason is really that uh, the length of uh, a vector field X in the Riemannian metric is the length of minus X. That seems obvious, but uh, it's true. So that means that actually the involution U goes to minus U um, on the unit circle bundle is uh, as a symmetry. And uh, what it gives you on my M on U cross R is uh, an involution uh, which actually takes the, the form alpha, the closed two form that I've talked about into a minus itself. So it's, it's anti-symplectic along the fibers, but the, uh, the annihilator of alpha is taken into itself, obviously, by Tor. So Tor actually preserves this horizontal subspace and is anti-symplectic on the fibers. So what that means is that this, um, representations which come from a metric actually lie not in, well, they lie in a subgroup of SL infinity R. So if we, uh, if we take this, this free involution on S1 cross R, then I'd like to define SP infinity R to be the, the subgroup commuting with, with Tor. Why SP infinity R? Well, one is that the uh, one reason is that the invariant polynomials that I talked about, so they, of course they, we're talking about a, a non-compact symplectic uh, manifold, but I mean, if we have a, a, a function of compact support, say, then the invariant polynomials like the integral of f to the m, these vanish in even degree. And so that's the sort of thing that happens in sp2nr in finite dimensions. 
Of course, it also happens for the orthogonal group. There's another reason for me not wanting to call this the orthogonal group. Anyway, so, so this acts on the quotient of S1 cross R modulo uh, the involution. And so, uh, uh, so geometrically, what we know is obvious fact that uh, the fundamental group for a negatively curved uh, metric actually acts on the space of unoriented geodesics. So it, it, you know, so it actually sits inside the holonomy of a connection that we obtained this way, sits inside this subgroup SP infinity R. So if we really want to fill out some component of representations in S of infinity R, then we need to have a, a different way of constructing them. And the obvious way, well, it seems to be the obvious anyway, is to relax the condition of a, uh, a Riemannian metric and take a Finsler metric. So, I mean, a Finsler metric is a, a smooth family of norms on the uh, tangent bundle. Uh, but really, it's, I mean, it's even simpler than that. It's, uh, I mean, you can, it's uniquely determined by, by the unit circle bundle. Um, so basically, what we have is a, a, a hypersurface inside the tangent bundle of sigma, which fibers over sigma and such that the fiber is a convex closed curve, which contains the origin. That's, that is the definition of a Finsler metric, basically. This is the unit, these are the unit vectors in a norm for a, a Pinsler metric. And uh, Cartan, uh, many years ago, uh, found that there was a, a canonical basis, just like the one I described for, um, for a Riemannian metric. So if you want to read about this, you don't need to go back to Cartan, but Robert Bryant has written several papers which, uh, which use this. So what is the difference? So the difference is we now have uh, Z, we have a vector field along the fibers, and we have X, <coughs> the geodesic flow. You can find a Finsler metric, you know, of course defines a, uh, okay, there's a dual metric on the, uh, sorry, a dual norm. If you have a norm on the tangent space, then there's a dual norm on the cotangent space. So there's a corresponding uh, unit circle bundle in the cotangent bundle. And, uh, and there's a geodesic flow, which is tangential to that. And so X is the geodesic flow. And then there's another vector field Y, which actually, um, so there's this notion of uh, orthogonality uh, in Finsler surf for Finsler surfaces. So uh, the, it really comes from the idea that if you have a curve in a Riemannian surface, then what we know is that the shortest distance from a point to that curve is a geodesic which intersects it orthogonally. So these X and Y are kind of related orthogonally in the same setting in Finsler geometry. You have a curve, you take a geodesic from a point to that curve, then there's a condition between the tangent vector of that curve and the tangent vector to the geodesic at it, the, which is uh, which is the analog orthogonality, and that's the, really the relationship between x and y. But the difference between uh, this and uh, and Riemannian metric is that, uh, for example, k is still the curvature, but it's a function now not on the surface sigma; it's a function on the on u on the unit circle bundle. If you like, um, if you like, x and y define a horizontal subspace in u which gives you a, a connection, a diff S1 connection. And then uh, the curvature of a diff S1 connection should be a, a function on the base with values in vector fields along the fibers. And that's precisely what KZ is. But now we also have these other functions, S, S and C, which complicate matters. So anyway, so we still have this same, same setup. Um, in fact, the, the um, Integral curves of X, okay, project down to geodesics. Uh, the integral curves of Y uh, actually have a lot in common with geodesics, but there's one feature which they, where they differ. So let me just mention that. So in the Finsler geometry, if you have, if you look at the integral curves of X, they find geodesics. So if you look at uh, another way of looking at the space of geodesics is to look at uh, Jacobi fields along a geodesic. 
So even in Finsler geometry, they satisfy the same equation, f double prime plus kf equals zero. And then to say that the, the space of geodesics has a symplectic structure is to say that we need a, a skew form on solutions to this equation. And that skew form is the, is the Vronskin. That's a, that's the, that defines the symplectic form of the space of geodesics. If you do the same for the integral curves of y, then these Jacobi fields actually give you a, a differential equation which is not self-adjoint. So there's no, although they have many features in common with uh, geodesics, uh, they actually um, are not, don't give a symplectic uh, surface. Anyway, we don't need to do that. We're using the, the, the flow of y to pull things around. And that's, so, that's what you do. So in other words, so what I'm saying is actually that with this setup, you can define in exactly the same way uh, a form alpha on m cross r, on u cross r, and uh, you find that you'll get a, a, a representation in, uh, in, in SL infinity r in the symplectic diff Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of S1 cross r. But the key issue is this, that um, this, this question about uh, uh, orientations on geodesics now is uh, is very different because there's there are, you have in Finsler geometry you have forward geodesics and backward geodesics. What are what the picture here is the one of the standard examples of a Finsler metric. It's the it's the problem of uh, crossing a river, you know, trying to get from A to B in the shortest time. So when the, the river is flowing in this direction, and so if you want to go downstream you go this way if you want to go upstream you go this way and so these are two geodesics in the Finsler uh, geometry but uh, the forward ones and the backward ones are different which means that in principle the holonomy should lie in SL infinity r rather than SP infinity r. Okay so uh, so now let's just go back this is a slide which appeared earlier and I want to actually uh, focus attention on this. So this was the end point of our discussion on SU infinity Higgs bundles. We said, well, if we follow this situation, if we, uh, we use Bicard's uh, uh, approach, we find uh, an SU infinity Higgs bundle with the right kind of shape for uh, uh, thinking of an SL infinity R uh, moduli space. Uh, but but how do we get there? How do we get from this kind of picture to what I would say is a Finsler a Finsler metric? So uh, the point is this: uh, so if the, the Higgs field here is a section of the pullback of the canonical bundle, but what is that? That's that's basically a map from M into the cotangent bundle to the total space of the canonical bundle. And it's, so it's a fiber preserving map, but M has this fold, this each, each uh, two sphere inside M has a uh, fold. Well, you have the, an involution, which actually means that it's only, it's the quotient by the involution, which uh, whose image goes into this, uh, into T star of sigma. So, but in print, but in particular, the, the fold, this circle bundle goes into a circle bundle inside the, the cotangent bundle here. And uh, what is that? Well, we can think of that as the uh, unit cotangent bundle of a, a Finsler metric. So, so uh, Bicard's uh, construction indirectly uh, gives us uh, a Finsler metric. And uh, if it's a small deformation from the one coming from the hyperbolic space, then it'll have negative curvature. So there's a chance here then that, uh, that these, uh, these metrics generated by by Bicard uh, actually might uh, might help to fill out the space of representations into SL infinity R. The trouble is that means you've got to try and calculate uh, calculate things, and um, so the thing that you try and do is to look at first order deformations, infinitesimal deformations. So. So we start with the, uh, the flat connection coming from uniformization. And then we want to try and understand the first order deformations of that. And then 
try and analyze uh, Bicard's deformations to see whether we can get uh, some information about how the holonomy of the flat connection deforms when we deform the, uh, the hypercalar metric. So how do we discuss infinitesimal deformations of uh, flat connections? Well, so here let's, let's go back and look at the, the uh, finite dimensional situation. So if you have a principal G bundle, then we have a curvature and uh, we have a, an exterior covariant exterior derivative, which if the curvature is zero, is, uh, gives us a complex. And the variation of a connection is given by one form with values in the Lie algebra bundle. So the variation of the curvature is dA of a dot. If you want a variation of a flat connection, then dA of a dot is equal to zero. So, actually, so you get a deformation class in the first cohomology of this, uh, this complex here. And in the good situations, when you have a, a nice uh, moduli space of flat connections, then this is, uh, this is uh, identified with a, a tangent vector to that uh, moduli space. So now what are we going to do with SL infinity R? Well, um, the Lie algebra is the <coughs> C infinity functions on S1 cross R modulo the constants. <coughs> so it actually makes a lot of sense to extend this group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms by by R. So, so that means, um, okay, so we'll, anyway, the holonomy will have a little bit more to it, which is basically the cohomology of, of, the, of the surface with values in the reals. Anyway, anyway, the, so the complex here is basically we, we pull back the exterior forms on sigma to M, and then we have a, a DA operator on this and the deformation class. So we have a it's in the cohomology of this. So this is now an infinite dimensional uh, space. <clears throat> so we're going to consider deformations of, uh, uh, of the flat connection coming from a, uh, a hyperbolic metric. So, so we're starting with a hyperbolic metric. So this is, um, okay, we can think of the units circle bundle as SL2R over gamma. And now these x, y, z are these the standard left invariant vector fields on SL2R descending uh, down to the quotient. Uh, the form here, the, the symplectic connection is defined by, by a rather, rather simple form. Uh, cosh t and sinh t are the, uh, the two solutions to this uh, second order differential equation. And uh, if we can, we can write a, a a typical uh, one form uh, representing a class in uh, in this cohomology as in terms of the uh, these canonical two forms omega and theta are sections actually on the unit circle bundle of the pullback of the cotangent bundle of sigma and then this da operator uh, looks like this so this is what it is so we use this x y and z and we have a derivative with respect to t so it's Essentially, it's the okay. It's equivalent to actually the exterior derivative if you identify certain subspaces uh, with with four forms. Okay, so um, so now the the key point is that uh, this um, this unit circle bundle is a a CR manifold. So we have some distinguished functions on this, which are uh, CR functions, if you like Cauchy Cauchy Riemann functions. They satisfy a Cauchy Riemann equation, x complex uh, functions, which satisfy x plus i y h equals zero. And uh, the relationship between z is, is this. So if, uh, if we can break these up under the circle action, which is equivalent to breaking up uh, under the eigenspaces of uh, the action of z, then if, if you take, uh, if m is a is integer, then it defines a it descends onto the surface sigma to be a holomorphic section of the nth power of the, of the canonical bundle. So we can realize powers holomorphic sections of the canonical bundle on sigma as functions on U, which uh, uh, satisfy these equations. The CR equation 
and the uh, eigenspace for the action of z. <clears throat> so, um, okay, so actually if you break this function up into uh, real and imaginary parts and uh, look at it, then you see that actually you can define a class here. Okay, well, we won't go too far back, but if you look at this, you, you'll see that this, you have a class that's such a da a equals zero <clears throat> expressed this way. So any holomorphic uh, section of k to the m actually defines a, uh, a class in, uh, in, this, in this cohomology here. So these are, we call these CR deformations. And uh, notice that the dependence on T is uh, exponentially decreasing. So a lot of things uh, come out from that. So, <clears throat> well, the first thing is that these, um, these are harmonic. These, are, as you might expect, if they satisfy a Cauchy-Riemann equation, so these are like harmonic uh, classes in this uh, cohomology. And this, uh, this space of CR functions, as you see, breaks up as this, uh, uh, well, we can, okay, we, we're going from two to infinity, but uh, the, and when m equals one, then this is, this is to do with the lifting from the Hamiltonian ones to, I mean, it's choosing a Hamiltonian, uh, rather than a Hamiltonian vector field, but uh, let's let's leave that to one side. We have this distinguished space, which has all the all the features that we're looking for in a, a except this is a tan, you know a potentially a tangent space. Uh, we also have a, a, a symplectic a skew form on these on these classes. Uh, so actually, this is like the Atiyah Bot symplectic form. So because this this so the, remember the Atiyah Bot symplectic form in finite dimensions is given by the Killing form. Uh, applied to the one forms with values in the Lie algebra. So here, we, the analog of the killing form is the integral of f squared times the, the symplectic form. And in our case, the symplectic form is this. So this is the, the pure analog of the Atiyah-Bot symplectic form. Anyway, on this, <coughs> this vector space, uh, we have a, a non-degenerate symplectic form. And <coughs> so we have, this, we have this set of classes inside um, inside this, uh, this, this cohomology, which have the right shape, if you like, to be a, uh, a tangent space to a, a Teichmuller space, an infinite dimensional version, as n goes to infinity of the Teichmuller spaces that we, that we know. But the question is, what has it got to do with the uh, Bicard's uh, structure? So then if you do this, if you try to do this, you've got to actually consider deformations of the symplectic connection coming from uh, Finsler, uh, deformations of a hyperbolic metric as Finsler manifolds. And uh, that involves uh, okay, the variations in these one forms, omega and eta. These uh, omega and eta themselves are local expressions, but these F1 and F2 satisfied a differential equation. And so actually it involves <coughs> an integral transform here. So. So life gets quite complicated. On the other hand, uh, okay, if, if we look at uh, deformations, first order deformations of uh, the B card, so deformations of the Finsler metric, then everything is determined by a function U, which looks like this, where A1 and A2 basically define a, a differential of degree K, of degree M. And then you get some, some all the formulas that involve uh, this function u here. Incidentally, notice that when m is equal to two, k dot is equal to zero and c dot is equal to zero, which means that we're, we're going in the direction of a, um, a constant curvature metric, which is what we know is the case. When m equals two, we have ordinary type of space. Anyway, <coughs> anyway, if you do this, you get expressions, but it's very difficult to say that, uh, to actually determine what the cohomology class is. After all, you know, we would like it to be equal to something in this space of CR deformations. And it's almost impossible to, uh, to do that. But what you can do, and it takes a bit of work, is to actually orthogonally project onto this harmonic subspace. So there are various features which uh, allow one to do that. 
so actually one of them is this that um that the function so i'm i'm choosing fixing a particular m and looking at a deformation for that m so i'm looking at the deformations given by differentials of degree m and then the function well, then this this procedure here involves uh, this sort of uh, action on for if you like functions on the group if we go to sl sl 2r it's, it's it involves something like this we have a function f on sl 2r we have the left action of y on it we we're, we're, we're exponentiating this action we're multiplying by some function of s and we're integrating and we're getting a function here so this is the left action of y but we also have the this this uh, commutes with the right action but we know that f actually uh, um, is uh, lies in a, an eigenspace of the casimir and the the casimir the left casimir is the right casimir so actually when you do this transform what you get is uh, is also an eigenspace of the of the casimir with the same eigenvalue and so when we do an integration against one of the other ends <clears throat> then actually you're going to get you're going to get zero so so what this without doing any calculations or very few we can say that actually when we when we start with a deformation which is given by a section of k to the m and we project onto this harmonic subspace then we get zero except for the case of uh, n equals m and uh, but uh, in fact it turns out that despite this um this complicated integral transform actually if you if you only want the uh, the projection onto onto this fixed uh, space then you can work it out you find that it's, uh, it's anyway anyway you find that the infinitesimal deformations actually inject into h1 of a so so what this means is that we have this family of folded hyperkähler metrics defined by b card we interpret the boundary of this hyperkähler metric as defining a finsler metric we look at a, a variation of uh, the symplectic connection from the hyperbolic case given by these directions and then what we find is that that injects into the infinitesimal deformation space so what it's saying is that actually the uh, these Finsler metrics capture um, <clears throat> capture uh, the uh, a lot of information uh, about the uh, about the holonomy of the symplectic connection. So what is it? Uh, where does it point? So it points to this. So this is really what I've been. I would love love to achieve or get somebody else to achieve. Um, so the conjecture is really that there should be a an analog of those SLNR moduli spaces, which were sums of differentials, and that, in, that this infinite dimensional sum of differentials uh, is basically the space of the CR functions on this uh, this quotient here on the the unit circle bundle. So the uh, the conjecture is that this should be isomorphic to a connected component of the moduli space of representations of pi one into SL infinity R into the Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of S1 cross R. I mean, having said that, of course, I haven't actually given you a topology to put on this. And so that's, the, that's maybe one of the problems. What I would also like to say is that actually every point in this space, in this component should be represented by a, the action of pi one on the geodesics of a negatively curved Finsler metric. Uh, so in other words, given any negatively curved Finsler metric, we have a representation of pi one into SL infinity R. It should actually lie, its equivalence class should lie in this, this component. On the other hand, we have some, B card gives us some distinguished uh, Finsler metrics which depend on having a holomorphic structure on the surface. And uh, so I would like to think of these as being like uh, harmonic uh, representatives uh, of the, uh, of a, so given any Finsler, negatively curved Finsler metric, I would like to think that it's holonomy has, if you like, uh, is represented by, by uh, 
a rather special um, Finsler metric, which is the one which comes from, from Picard. So there are lots of, uh, lots of things involved with this, um, lots of tasks to do. I mean, the first one is really to try and extend Picard's existence theorem uh, from a neighborhood of the origin in, in space of CR functions to, to the full, full space. Um, after that, one would uh, need to also uh, try and discover whether the, the curvature of the corresponding fins of the metric is, is negative. There are all sorts of issues here. Actually, there's one more immediate issue, which is uh, that uh, I said earlier that Ricci flow techniques said that every representation coming from a negatively curved Riemannian metric is connected to a uniformizing representation. And there are all sorts of flow equations which one could try and look at for Finster surfaces. Uh, I don't know whether it's true that uh, a negatively curved Finster uh, surface is connected through negatively curved Finster metrics to to uh, to uh, you, to constant negative curvature ones. But, uh, that's that's a, a much uh, a simpler question. Anyway, there are all sorts of questions uh, related to this, so, but I'm, I'm convinced somehow that there is, there is a bigger picture, uh, but uh, this is a, a first step towards that. So I've probably overstepped my time, so I better, better stop there. Okay, let's, uh, let's thank everyone, uh, Nigel, for a very interesting talk. And uh, so if you would like to ask a question, ask a question, uh, you can use the raise your hand uh, feature or uh, alternatively, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask if, uh, if no one else is asking. So, so maybe let me start. Uh, there was an earlier question by, by Ed Burstyn. Um, the question was, uh, so th this uh, moduli space of basically infinite dimensional representations that you're talking about, you, I think you've already partially answered the question. The question is, uh, is it still expected to be symplectic, like uh, what we know of character varieties? Yes, uh, actually, unfortunately, I've lost my my Zoom. I don't know what I've done. Uh, okay, I, I was thinking I'm still connected. But, uh, oh, okay, okay. Can you see me now? I don't know. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so this uh, this space uh, based on on uh, yeah. So these the same. Picture. So, I mean, I, I, I spoke about the analog of the Atia, yes, the Atia part symplectic form. So, the what I wrote down was the integral of A wedge B wedge alpha, which is the analog of, the, of that. And that is a um, that is a non degenerate that is non degenerate on this space of C, C uh, formally non degenerate, shall we say, on this space of CR functions. Well, actually, not so, not so formally because we're, they're functions on a compact manifold on U. So, um, so yes, so the, the symplectic, I certainly expect the symplectic geometry to, to appear. And so you can ask all sorts of questions like what is the, what is the analog of the Goldman functions and the, uh, what is the relationship between the, the Poisson brackets and, uh, and the Goldman bracket. Um, so, and, uh, yeah, so there, there are various uh, ways in which you can, um, so how should I put it? So there are, there are obvious questions which one can ask here. One is that, what is the, so what we know is that for the finite dimensional ones, the SLNR ones, that every, represent, every the representation, every element in the fundamental group goes into a positive hyperbolic element in SLNR. So it's a, it's a, a real diagonalizable matrix with positive uh, uh, values. So this is what we know. And so you could ask yourself the question about well, what, are the, what are the Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of S1 cross R, which are analogous to that positive hyperbolic. Certainly, I mean, the, the ones that come from, uh, from metrics of negative curvature uh, certainly have that, that feature. You can, you can look at the, the action on the circles in the circles given by points. I mean, well, I, I can't do that without a, 
uh, a black book. But, but certainly there is there is a notion of the um, the eigenvalue, positive eigenvalue for one of these. So certainly, so the ones that come geometrically from negatively curved surfaces uh, definitely have the, uh, a property which is analogous to positive hyperbolicity. But there are all sorts of other questions which one can, uh, one can, one can discuss in principle about that. Uh, what about uh, but, uh... Uh, so, it, so it, visual character varieties usually have these symplectic tori appearing, and in fact, the cluster structure. Would you expect something similar to appear here? Uh, yeah, that might be more difficult to achieve uh, in this infinite dimensional context. Um, no, I'm the, no, I mean, there are all sorts of questions which are, I mean, you know, or maybe, or maybe it's not, it's, so <laughs> if it's not symplectic tori, that maybe uh, maybe some kind of replacement. Uh, would you would you have yeah. a guess? Uh, I wouldn't like to make a guess. Actually, I mean, I, actually, that that's that's one aspect of these character varieties which I'm less familiar with, and I, I'm sure that many of you who are watching are more more familiar with. So. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's worth worth trying to see what see what happens. Anyway. Are there are there any other questions? Um, I've got uh, a short question. That's Anton speaking. Yeah. Uh, so, so you you started your your talk by building those uh, symplectomorphisms of a two sphere, starting from finite dimensional representations and then making their size bigger and bigger. And then uh, we know that uh, SL2R, it also has interesting infinite dimensional representations. So are they possibly related to the, right? Of course, that's a very different flavor, uh, but uh, do you think the, the corresponding like algebraic approach may be related to the geometry that you are developing here to, to, to make essentially also, you want the dimension of representations or dimension of SLN go to infinity, and maybe one way to do it is to to map SL2R to some uh, infinite to to endomorphisms of some infinite dimensional space. Of course, maybe it's not it's completely unrelated to to what you're doing. But any any hints of how this may be related? That's an interesting question. Um, So in the way we have, so we have SL2R sitting inside uh, SL infinity R, and you're asking some question about whether a unitary representation, an infinite dimension, a unitary representation of SL2R, what might extend or induce somehow to a, a unitary representation of uh, SL infinity R. Um, I think, um, not clear about that actually. I mean, so uh, if we, um, somehow, um, no, no, actually, I mean, what I would like to think of somehow is that, you know, the, that expression for the tuplex operators um, suggests that, uh, you know, that uh, this moduli space, you know, how should I put it this way? Those finite dimensional moduli spaces, the moduli spaces for SLNR, uh, it, it worried me for quite a long time that SL2R has a, an interpretation in terms of the geometry of a, of a surface, constant negative curvature. The ones for SL3R also do uh, in terms of um, uh, project, convex projective structures. And the, uh, the attempts by people, Laboury and uh, Wienhardt and others to to give uh, geometric structures corresponding to the other uh, versions of Teichmuller space have, have never been quite satisfactory for me because they involve piling some extra information, uh, not you know, piling, looking at a, a much bigger uh, manifold, which is a fiber bundle over, over a surface. And so on the other hand, what we've got here when n goes to infinity is uh, something classical. You know, we've got the classical geometry basically of um, what I would say was fin the, fin's the metrics of the negative curvature. So I, I like to think of the 
the finite dimensional ones as being quantizations, you know, so the the tuplets, the Berezin quantization, the tuplets operator point of view, suggests that somehow <laughs> this go, n going to, in, to infinity is, uh, is a classical limit of, um, of the, of, so the others are, if you like, quantizations at different levels, depending on n, of this, of this classical one. That's the way, in, more of the way in which I, but in terms of actual uh, representations, you, I mean, of course, there's work done on the unitary representations of different morphism groups, different, different morphisms of the circle and so forth, and of course, the loop groups and so forth. So, symplectic different morphisms of S1 cross R, I don't, I don't know quite what's been done about that. But, um, but it's, well, it's an interesting question. Yeah, the other, I mean, well, what I would say is that, um, you know, the, the space of geodesics on uh, the upper half space is if you, I mean, if you like, that's a co-joint orbit. When you quantize that, you get the principal series. And when you look at the discrete series, uh, well, the discrete series comes from quantizing the other, uh, the other one. And yet it's the, in this case, we're trying to understand the, the space of geodesics, uh, but we're, we're understanding it by looking at something transverse to that, which is these holomorphic differentials. So there's a sense, a sense in which the orthogonality of the, the two series of, of irreducible representations is kind of uh, coming down to this, the, the, the way in which we're, we're looking at uh, cohomology of functions on the, uh, on the space of, uh, of geodesics in terms of uh, holomorphic differentials. No, but I think the, the other question about the unitary representations is, is a very interesting one. So uh, I think that's, that's something which could well be followed up, but it's been a very different uh, category of uh, mathematics. Thank you. Any, uh, any more questions? Uh, maybe, maybe I have another question. Uh, 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 what would be the analog of uh, for SU infinity Higgs bundles of Higgs bundles with poles and and uh, and more importantly, what would that mean mean from the view of the the Finsler, Finsler geometry? Well, there are um, so for SL two R, there are other components uh, which uh, do rep. Okay, there are other components of representations of pi one into SL two R, and they relate to um, to uh, constant negative curvature metrics with uh, cone singularities. Uh -huh. Now that doesn't exhaust all the uh, uh, all the possibilities, but that's that's one. So the um, so the most most amenable type of generalization would be. Uh, I guess introducing the same same sort of cone singularity into uh, Finsler or Riemannian geometry with a um, but without any any conditions on the curvature of the negative curvature. Mm -hmm. So if you go yes, so, I mean if you if you're going to have distinguished points, then the metrics which you get are going to have to have some distinguished property. The model for this is for the SL2R case. If, yeah, if the SL2R is going to sit inside this, uh, then yeah, so I, I would guess that it, you, you would need the same kind of cone singularities for the, as, as you get in the finite dimensional situation for the other components of SL2R. But somehow in, in finite dimensional case, uh, you know, the residue Let's say the residue of a Higgs bundle. That's usually somehow really somehow related to angle of the cones, uh, singularity, etc. So well, here it's it feels like the residue should be some kind of infinite dimensional perhaps thing. Um, well, I'm not so sure. I mean, you see, it's it's a property of the Higgs field, really. Maybe yeah, it's a property of the Higgs field. So so that whereas my Higgs fields are actually embedding uh, my uh, hypercalar manifold into the cotangent bundle. You could think of the Higgs field actually having a sort of branching and so that the image would uh, 
something would go singular at the point at which the Higgs field uh, vanishes. In fact, that's, mm -hmm. I think of the finite dimensional situation, that's true. So the, uh, yeah, so that's right. So the Higgs field, the Higgs field for the, um, for, yeah, for zero, one, Q zero, never vanishes right, because of the one. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas uh, in the other situations, actually, instead of the one, you have a, a section of a line bundle which has zeros, and so, so I, th I think I think that's the sort of thing to expect. That your, your basic picture might be the same, but using the Higgs field to map this hyperkähler mm -hmm. manifold into the cotangent bundle would introduce singularities uh, at the, uh, on the image. Um, Nikita, uh, I think there is a question on the chat. Yeah, there's a question from Lisa Jeffrey. Uh, so, so she says, uh, uh, Doistema uh, studied relationship between cohomology of a symplectic manifold and that of the fixed point set of an anti-symplectic involution. Um, what are the analogs of this in uh, this infinite dimensional situation? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um... I mean, there's no, as you see, the, I mean, conjecturally, there's no topology going for these, in these cases, uh, the whole thing should be contractible. Um, okay, well, then it doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, um, no, well, maybe it does. I mean, you see the, I mean, one of the uh, fixed point sets of the anti, I mean, S, my SP infinity space was a fixed point set. Uh, on the other hand, okay, no, maybe it does. I, don't, I mean, SP of this prototype of this is, CPN and RPN. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, but, you know, there are different, I mean, there are different involutions, there are different anti, anti, natural anti-symplectic involutions on S1 cross R. Well, one of them I described uh, SP infinity R in terms of, but SP infinity R actually has one of these Teichmuller components, SP 2 nr has one of these Teichmuller components, a contractible one. I mean, it does have other other components actually, but um, uh, but there's another involution which leads you to what I call SO infinity R, which is uh, not the SO infinity that occurs with SU infinity, but it's kind of related to it. Uh, and that, yeah, I don't know. You can play around with these. I mean, I don't think the cohomology is going to be these. These are infinite dimensional spaces, and so I don't think there's. I think there's a lot of, uh, one would have to struggle to actually uh, uh, say something about it. On the other hand, if we look for n equals infinity versions of, uh, of moduli spaces where we do have non-trivial cohomology, then uh, maybe the, maybe the non-triviality persists. You know, there are all sorts of things that might, might conceivably happen. I w I've been focusing on the on this uh, particular situation, because it seemed to me that uh, there was something at the limit, which namely action on geodesics. Uh, actually, I should also say, okay, I should mention this, that there is another similar moduli space that Labore constructs, uh, uh, <coughs> which is um, based on symplectic uh, diffeomorphism or Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of S1 cross R. The thing is that his diffeomorphisms are not smooth. That his, and his circle, if you like, is the circle at infinity of, and it's the circle at infinity of the fundamental group. So it's a, it's a kind of fractal circle. But he, he does have a, a space of, um, a moduli space, which shares a number of features uh, with this one. Um, but it's uh, definitely not the same. Uh, but uh, so, but what the link between them is? Uh, I'm using very different methods. What the link between them is, I, I, I couldn't really say. So, so there are kind of other models of high dimensional or infinite dimensional tangular spaces, which actually uh, include uh, some of the same uh, representations. So, in fact, his certainly his. He told me his includes the representations uh, given by the action of pi one on the geodesics of a, of a, of a Riemannian metric. Thank you very much. Any, any other questions? 
Um, okay, well, so if, if there are no more questions, then let's thank Nigel again for this wonderful talk. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, so next week we have uh, Alejandro Cabrera uh, speaking about uh, uh, semi-classics. Okay. Thank you so much, Nigel. Much, Nigel. Okay. All right. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye you. Bye. bye. See you next week. See you next okay. week. Bye bye.